Well, hello there. Hey. Friends, lovers, Christmas celebrants. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us. Today is Sunday, and it is Five Minutes with Robert and Amy Naser. And you, and thank you for joining us. I see we already have folks in the chat. We are live on Facebook, live on YouTube, live all over the place. And we're glad that you are here. Today is Sunday, as I said, Sunday, December 3rd. First show of December, December. Woo! Man, are we going to be having a good time in Woo! December? And the reason is time is running <laughs> out. Well, no, it's not. There's always January. There's oh, yeah. always January. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, time is time is running out. We are all mortal. Memento mori. Everything is finite. Okay, we'll tie all that together. We're going to have some fun with this. Today is Sunday, December 3rd, the 337th. Are there even 337 days in a year? The 337th day of this, your best year yet. If it's not your best year yet, no, it's not too late. You've got 28 days left to fill in whatever the gaps, whatever the little things, whatever you didn't do. If you didn't dance enough, dance a little extra. If you didn't sing enough, sing a little bit extra. God, that sounds silly. Let's get more serious. If you didn't produce, produce a little bit extra. Exercise those virtues. Because it's December. It is Christmas time. Christmas is in just two, two, count them, 22 days. 22. Yeah. And then, you know, Halloween's only in 333 days. So yes. they come at us fast <laughs> and furious. Fast and furious 11, the sequel or whatever number they're on now. It uh, is December 3rd. Jennifer says we are only immortal for a limited time. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> so don't hurry. rush. This Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Yes. Limited do time. rush. Limited well, engagement. We're actually going to talk about rush a bit or at least Getty Lee. We will get to that as well. But real quick. It's December 3rd, the day of the first human heart transplant. Wow! You know, they've actually done heart transplants. Yes, they have that first one, 1967, in South Africa. No, it wasn't in America. I'm always surprised when the first of anything happens anywhere but in America. Prejudiced much? But no, no, the great Christian martyred uh, doctor who performed the first heart transplant, a little bit sad, the 53-year-old Louis Washkansky received the transplant in Cape Town, South Africa, and he lived for mm -hmm. another 11 days. And okay. then, unfortunately, he caught pneumonia, uh. probably due to the drugs that were being used to help the body not reject the new heart. Yes. Well, it you know squelches the immune system, so your yep. body doesn't fight it off. But it was a great start, a great start, a great victory. Also, December 3rd, 1992, now we're going to hit a little bit closer to home here, not just time-wise, but on December 3rd, 1992, the first SMS text message was sent. Now, some of you know what SMS is. Some of you think, oh, isn't that like uh, what the Brits call their ships? No, it was the first short message service message sent over the cell phone networks. Now, who do we know who does that kind of thing? I do SMS marketing. You That's do right. SMS marketing. <laughs> That's right. Amy is the, the guru. If if it wasn't for you, that place would just fall apart. Nobody would get their text messages. Nobody would get their emails. I know. Those are very basic things and necessary things that people, you know, they're, they're, they have because of me. <laughs> yes. And there's one more tie-in, the very first SMS message. Do you know what it was? Some of you in the chat oh, might well I know. I don't know. Actually, that's a new one. Because it happened on December 3rd, the very first text message was sent actually from a computer to a cell phone, and it was Merry Christmas. Oh, that's sweet. Is that sweet? <laughs> everything that's today. That's really sweet. Everything oh is going to tie gonna, in together today. You know today. what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a hold of our um, our social media um, partner uh, people in our, in our organization and have them send that out and just, you know. They need to know that. Us. They need to tie that in in some way or maybe several ways. Yes. Because it is super sweet. Incidentally, I told you about my prejudice. Everything great, everything new happens in the U.S., right? No. That first text message happened in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. In the U.K. Uh, Neil Papworth, a 22-year-old engineer, used a personal computer to send the text message, Merry Christmas, via the Vodafone network. Wow. To the phone of a colleague. It was, it was one of those funny old cell phones with the, like, they have a base as well as a handset, like an old style phone. Funniest thing. But 
everything starts somewhere, whether it's the first heart transplant or the first text message or great companies that you need to know about because Christmas is right around the corner. It's also National Candle Day, mm. the day that we celebrate the venerable, the warm, the fiery, the beautiful candle. We know one of the best candle makers on earth. That's right. So in the show notes, because there's always show notes, there are links to everything we talk about on 5 Minutes with Robert and Amy Naser. Almost. And in the show notes, it does say Happy Candle Day because it is Candle Day. But the link you'll see is to Orem Naturals. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the folks at Orem Naturals are working diligently to make sure all the Christmas orders get out on time. But I'm going to guess they probably have room for a few more orders. So, <laughs> Orem, spelled like you would think uh, gold. A-U, gold. You physicists know what I'm talking about. A-U-R-U-M. A-U-R-U-M dash naturals. It's in, the, it's in the show notes. Just click that link. Buy, these are uh, most of their inventory is beeswax, like genuine beeswax, not not chemicals. As much as we love petroleum here, petroleum doesn't make the best candles. You want beeswax. You want it to burn clean. Mm -hmm. You don't want ash and soot all over your ceiling. You don't yeah, want that don't chemical want that, smell. Yeah, you don't want that. I was going to say the chemical smell, especially of like the smoky smell after the wick goes, um, it gets a little long and it starts mushrooming and kind of ballooning, and you get that. Oh, that awful wick smell. Yeah. Now there, yeah, there, the Orm Naturals doesn't do that. Um, yeah. It's great stuff. And there are other natural ways to make candles. They have bayberry candles, for example. But beeswax is the way to go, mm -hmm. especially for me because I'm a little allergy prone. And uh, most of their beeswax candles are not scented. You, you can get aromatherapy candles. You can get all of that. But well, I, I like a candle that just smells like beeswax because it doesn't... Smell like petroleum wax where there's no fragrance you know, at all. What it, if there is a fragrance? It's honey. It's it honey. It smells like honey. Yeah, it smells like honey. Yeah, it smells nice. like beeswax. Beautiful, and they burn long, like they burn four or five times longer than a petroleum candle would burn. Good, good stuff. So go there. Also, since we're talking about Christmas, we're talking about Christmas candles. We're talking about Christmas celebrations. We're going to keep going. It's the first day of Advent. Mm. Now. Wait, is that? Let, I thought it was like the first or something. Well, <laughs> it varies in length what? from 22 to 28 days, starting on the Sunday nearest St. Andrew's Day. Oh. And encompassing the next three a, Sundays ending uh, on Christmas Day. Okay, it starts on a Sunday. Now, the reason why, of course, I didn't know that before I researched it, you didn't know that, yeah. is because what do we love about Advent? Chocolate. Uh, a little hint. We're, we're not. <laughs> Religious here. <laughs> no, what well, we love about Advent, yeah, we love Advent calendars. And, you know, including yeah. the Advent calendars that have chocolates for every day that you open the drawer or the door or whichever kind of calendar you have. Uh, but there are so many fun themed Advent calendars. And it's a great way to count down. I know you go into department stores, you go into luxury stores, and you see these Advent calendars, and maybe they seem a little kishy. You should have an Advent calendar because it is a fun way to count down the days until Christmas. So happy first Sunday of Advent, December 3rd, 2023. And then one more. Mm. It is National Roof Over Your Head Day. I roof like that. Roof Over Your Head Day. The roof, the roof, the roof is over your head. You know, <laughs> we we get cynical because in these days where the, those, those poor unfortunate souls... You know, we were in Jamaica for yeah. our honeymoon many years ago, and uh, you know, people actually lived under tin roofs. Tin roofs. And when it rained, it was just they were rusted. <laughs> yes. No, no. Tin they, roof rusted. Tin yeah. roofs don't rust, but. <laughs> but no, I mean, people actually live that way, um, and uh, thankfully, I think it's gotten a lot better. Yes. Um, There's a very sad news story. There was mm. a murder recently on the West Coast. Some guy decides to start shooting at homeless people. Mm. Oh, right. And it's it's very sad, and especially because some of the reactions are, I'm so sick of all the homeless people in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, and they're destroying the city, property values going through the toilet. I totally get that. I understand the feeling of anger and resentment and frustration that law enforcement doesn't do it, et cetera, et cetera. Point is, it's fraught. It's yeah. complicated. Yeah. One thing we can do that's very simple, and no matter where you stand on this politically, culturally, whatever, the one thing you can do is say, man, I am glad I have a roof over my head. Yeah. Whether you're in a house, you're in an apartment, you live on the road in a mobile vehicle, wherever you live, if there's something keeping the rain or... If you're in Motown, the snow off of your head, happy 
national roof over your head today. Yeah, and, and nowadays it's actually not too difficult to find a shelter if you don't have a roof over your head. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, there's so many services. The people who we often see homeless either have too much pride to take advantage of government services, and that goes back to a tradition way back when mm-hmm. it would be easy to say nowadays, well, come on, they're, they're tax dollars paid for that for years. They should be taking advantage. Ethics of emergencies and the question of scholarships, and we have answers to all of that, but... Mm-hmm. But I totally get it. I grew up at a time when, you know, accepting any kind of welfare payments was considered a, ma- a matter of shame, even if you were forced to pay into it for years. So the point is, yeah, totally get it. Yeah. Totally get it. But yeah, we should be we should be happy and not just grateful that we have roofs over our heads, but grateful for homes, for architecture, for builders, for construction, for all of the things that yeah, are tied in. Yeah, I mean, in. Th- this is our, our house was built in the 60s and it's still standing. <laughs> it's still <laughs> so, standing. Da, 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 da. It's amazing. Yes, and Jennifer's right. Up on the roof is a great song. Sorry, I just happened to, I neglected the chat as I often do in the first few minutes of the five minutes of the show. I've said hello to everybody, I think. I don't think I've missed anybody. Oh, good. Gary's on Facebook. That's Excellent. great. Well, I'm done with all of the opening stuff, but I'm going to tie it all together, as we always do, in a value-laden, important, and significant way. But first... <laughs> Hold on a second. Gary says, I was raised Catholic, and you guys just taught me about Advent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I knew about Advent, but I didn't know that it started on a Sunday. Because oh. when you go to the store and you have all the wonderful Christmas commercialism, yep, yep. it always starts. Uh, it, it, it lasts a full 25 days. Heck yeah. Um, not 22 or whatever. It's, you know, all the stuff we were brought up with has been superseded by commercial concerns. And that is a blessing it's a beautiful thing it is a wonderful thing i just want to say one more thing about that is that it's wonderful that so many people around the world have jobs they have they have a, an outlet for product productiveness of the virtue of productiveness and um they they actually can go out in the world engage with the world um support themselves through the money that they earn keep at least most of the money they earn if I, I wish that we could all keep all of the money that we earn <laughs> and just donate to the government for services. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a wonderful thing to be able to go out and be capitalistic. And for all of the bad mouthing and griping and the whining and all that stuff about capitalism, we're all capitalists. We all trade with each other and it's a mutual deal. We're not forced to do it. We're not... Uh, you know, forced to, you know, to, with a gun to our head to actually, you know, be a slave to anybody. We actually have, we have agency, we have empowerment as an individual, and it's a wonderful thing. So, power. So, Merry Capitalist Christmas. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. There's a conversation going on in the chat I might have to get to at some point here because uh, uh, Stephen says, I think if you're on a date with a woman, And she says she loves astrology and begins to explain it to you in detail. Well, you see lights in her eyes from all that passion. Isn't that great? Not irrational? The short answer to that is it's great and it is irrational, which means there's a contradiction there. And at some point, that's going to have to be dealt with. Now, I'm the last person to say... Well, then you should call off the date. You know, it's kind of modern way of saying, you know, you're out on a date and this person says something. When do you immediately walk out the door? You never immediately walk out the door. You act with class because that's the kind of guy you are, kind of gal you are. But, yeah, the question is, isn't that great and not irrational? No, it is great, but it's also irrational. And the parts that are great are not rational or are rational, and the parts that aren't great are irrational, and you're at some point, <laughs> you're going to have to sort it all out, because it's going to come up. Yeah, astrology is interesting in the sense that people want to have a vocabulary for psychology and character traits, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, the other side of that, you have to ask them, do you feel that you have the power to um guess or understand a person based on when they were born and you're going to make the assumption that they are whatever that whatever their astrological sign says that they are and you're going to assume that even if they don't act that way yeah you know is is that is that helpful is it helpful to make assumptions based on what the arbitrariness of when you were born 
I know it's kind of cool. No, it's not. I know it's kind of cool to say, well, I'm an Aries and, you know, I'm a Pisces. And, you know, it's kind of cool. And my, my, my spirit animal is the bunny or whatever. But, um, although mine is actually. But it, um, <laughs> it sounds really straightforward. It, it sounds, and it sounds kinda, like there would be. fun, but it's, it's uh, if you look at it a little bit more deeper, you'll realize that you're playing in fantasy and it's not a reality but, basis. But if for you're it. playing. Yeah. Play pretend. Then is there value in it? Or if you hold it as fiction, as a metaphor, is there value in it? Now, we all know the answer, of course. If you are rational, you dismiss all of that. And you dismiss all irrational people as soon as they say the first foolish thing. But, big conversation going on in uh, on the Facebooks, on the social media, in the John Galtline group. So it's a private mm. group. Those of you who are not Ayn Rand fans might not have access to that. But there's a long conversation going on about, and it's come up before, and it will come up again, raising your children with belief in Santa Claus. Mm, yeah. Not just as a fantasy, you know, because we tell children stories, and they know that they're just stories, but it's play, it's fun, it's all good. But letting them believe that there's a real magic man out there who sees them when they're sleeping, who knows when they're awake. I will just say from the outset that I think, well, you know Amy and I believe in Santa Claus. We visited Santa Claus several times this year. We visited him it's, yesterday. Yeah, we, we went to see Santa three times now. Yeah, and we're counting this year. We're just for fun. We're going <laughs> to see how many Santa. And we got to decide, do we count the bad Santas? Because no, we haven't had any yet this year. Thankfully, we've all had the, the real Santa. Yeah, all three of real them. Santas, not bad Santas. <laughs> Even the bad Santas are kind of real, but uh, so we we're total big fanboys, fangirls of Santa here, and I don't think acknowledging that this is fiction, this is metaphor, this is play, this is myth, takes anything away from the magic of it, and I mm -hmm. don't think that it takes anything away from the magic to acknowledge that with your young children too. It's like um, dressing up for Halloween, you know, you're not actually Spider-Man, <laughs> you know, you're not actually Barbie. But you can totally um, get into the role, you can, you can totally go hardcore, get into it. you could dress to the nines, you could get all their lines down, you can have maximum fun with it, and yes. not just in a goofy way, it can be really serious, yes. and still be play one and of the reasons, still be metaphor one of the reasons halloween is my favorite holiday but i love christmas of course but yeah. uh and i love santa and i talked to we talked to santa um and gosh all three santas were so jovial and lovely people they really were great guys i mean talk about um, modeling good character traits. Santa is a great role model, and um, I highly recommend him. And I and I highly recommend that you know you take your kids to see Santa after you tell them. Yes. Santa is a game we play. It's play pretend, like Halloween, like when you dress up. Um, and uh, Santa's fun, and he's wonderful, and uh, you you can get a little candy cane if you tell him what you want for Christmas. Yes. You know, it's a wonderful thing. So let me go back just a step here because I missed a couple of uh, these chats. And Eagle to Reality says, I was chatting with an Israeli today on the internet. They were pleasantly surprised that they had someone in their corner who was not Israeli. Obviously, other Israeli folks would be. Well, that's, that is charming to see. You know, th this is, I want to say something real quick. I, I really, really would love to reach out to more Israelis and kind of, you know, send them care packages, send them, you know, some kind of personal message, have a pen pal who's an Israeli or however, um, and uh, and really kind of just make it a little bit more psychologically real and humanistic for myself and make it more of a value. Um, the, the, and and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to be optimistic during wartime, right. but I think that's that's a wonderful thing that you did that. And, and uh, let me know how you contact them. Uh, message me if you would like. That would be wonderful. Yeah. And I want to tie all the, I always want to tie everything together. Stephen Katz had started this conversation out by saying, do you agree that a person having great passion about something that you consider irrational is more of a green flag than a red flag? And my answer to that is it is absolutely a red flag if you know what a red flag is. Now, if you're the kind of person who takes a red flag as, 
Oh, there's something to be concerned about. Therefore, I need to shut that door. Tell them to go away. And maybe I should denounce them before I slam the door on them just to make sure that they know I disagree. No, if that's what you take a red flag to mean, then, you know, that's a bit of a problem too. No, red flags are just telling you, be careful. Be cautious. There's something you need to be aware of here. In that case, yes, when somebody is irrational, that is absolutely a red flag. Don't let that turn you into a complete naysayer who shuts people off, who shuts them down, who feels a need to denounce every irrationality if it is a small aspect of their character and maybe even something they'd be opening to change down the line. But even if not, if it's a trivial matter, because Lord knows I know people in the objectivist community who have red flags, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I wouldn't lie to myself and say, no, it's a green flag because it makes them passionate. Well, some passions are <laughs> better than others. We'll put it that way. So you're probably on the right track if you are trying to avoid being irrationally, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? I was going to say sanctimonious, but that's not the right word. But you get the idea. You yeah. know, it, it it can be a little confounding, um, but it, it's it's it can be an opportunity if you're up for it. And yeah. this is hard. This is hard to do. Hard to do. But if you can do it, it's great. It's the idea of bringing out the best in yourself and other people. Yes. Um, of identifying. Um, so if you have somebody, a friend who is into astrology, um, identify the virtues of that. Which is, mm. I like to have the vocabulary of character traits of judging other people, of understanding other people, ah. of understanding what they like. If I like them, I want to know what they like. I want to be friendly with them. I want to have that friendship mirror going. I want those words to express my appreciation, my love for them. Um, yeah. And and you can say that. You can say, I really admire that part of the process wow. of astrology. Um, you can also, I we had a friend over, very lovely lady and everything, um, who ser who truly believed that um, after a, a, a loved a beloved pet passes away, that they're still residing in your home <laughs> as a ghost pet. And of course, I had to stop myself from you know saying <laughs> that's really hilarious that you know and completely you know I don't I didn't want to belittle or anything like that. But I I I said you know it's good because she might be watching right now. <laughs> But no, it's, it's, it was a wonderful opportunity to say, I, I you know, I really appreciate the idea of, you know, we really are attached to our pets, our beloved pets, and they become visceral for us. So yes, if I do feel a little nudge on my leg, I think of Dolly when she used to boot me with her nose. Um, if I feel like something's jumped up on my bed as I'm falling asleep, um, you know, I kind of think of her, and it's these visceral feelings that are going to last after a pet passes away um, that are that's going to give you an opportunity to remember them. You might feel sad, but you might also feel um, love for them even after they're gone, and it may be a positive thing, hopefully. So, um, so you know, bring out those the, the better parts of what people are saying and acknowledge those parts and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe in the other parts, but it's great that you have those values. Wow, that's some real value mining there. It's a lot of value mining. Um, but it, so if you're, up to, if you're up to it, it's great, but it takes practice. And um, it, it's important to value the people around you and to express what you value about them. So I've got to say, Sam is in the chat. Sam, oh yes, and, and he's, he's quoting the, the old Spanish proverb. Uh, pick what you want and pay the price. You know, the, uh, even Ayn Rand quoted that one. Take what you want and pay for it. Yes. And the point is that there will be a price to pay if there is irrationality in the mix. Uh, don't lie to yourself and say, well, because that makes the person passionate, it's a good thing. Now, the passion is good, and it may well make that person more of what you want that person to be. Just be aware when you're dealing with mixtures, don't just think, well, it all combines together and it's kind of gray and it's mostly good. As long as you can do that, stay focused on what's good, what's bad, what you've accepted, what you've desired, then yes, that can be a good thing. I'll leave it at that because it's kind of going to come up again. Real quick, under shameless self-promotion and what we're listening to this week, uh, Amy is on hiatus from the ARC UK. 
because you've had enough war um, in Israel and enough conversations about it. I did join for one day, so if you want to see that, the link is in the show notes under the topic. Uh, small wonder why Amy has decided enough of that. The topic was Hamas violates the ceasefire. Well, good times there. Now, these are important conversations, and they need to be had. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be you having them. So, The other thing... <laughs> Other thing that came up this week, and I'll bet most of you already know about this, but we did another midweek show, just like we did the week before last. Yes. We interviewed Mark Pellegrino, Hollywood actor, but also all around man of wisdom and action and good guy. And lover of the germs, the uh, the West Coast. Not the diseases. The West Coast. uh, The punk rock band. Punk rock band. Gotcha. Old school punk rock. Old school punk rock. With Darby Crash. That's true. The germs go way back. (laughs) Uh, yes. Good interview. Oh, it was great. If you haven't seen it yet, you, you totally should watch. That one was a good time. Fun, fun, fun. Yes. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do about other shows, self-promotion, because I want to get to what's on my mind. The war is on my mind, but not just the war in the Middle East. I'm not going to get into that. Who's right and who's wrong? We all know who's right and who's wrong. Um, Amy's been wearing her Star of David earrings. No, although, although I'm different. It's you're different, different tonight. Day. No, your uh, holidays. So Jim, Again. Jim asked me for a little close-up of this. Oh, I don't know. Okay. You can't see a close-up, but too bad. So sad. Get up and walk um, over to the camera. I don't know. You can kind of see here. It's like a little chandelier yeah, of red and gold. Yeah, don't quite show at a distance, but it's gorgeous. It's pretty. <laughs> it is. It is beautiful. And it's got the standard Amy modification, too, to yeah. work with your hoops. Yes, yes. So Very easy. Nice. So, so charming and lovely and very sweet. Mm-hmm. But the reason I want to talk about war is not what's going on. Or rather, it is what's going on, but the bigger picture. You know, tomorrow, December 4th, in Detroit, Michigan, the Fillmore Theater is going to host Getty Lee. Now, most of you know who Getty Lee is, but for those of you who don't, the singer and bass player of the amazing Canadian rock trio Rush. Mm-hmm. And he's touring, telling stories about the book he just wrote, My Effin Life. It's his, his autobiography. Getty Lee's parents were prisoners of war. No, not as soldiers, in the concentration camps in World War II. And he has lessons from that. And it takes me back because when I was young, so, you know, late 60s, 1970s, uh, when I was really young, we were still involved in the Vietnam War. But also war series on television and in films were very popular. Uh, Hogan's Heroes was a popular comedy, which kind of makes me shudder nowadays to think a World War II prisoner of war comedy, but they made it work. Yeah. It uh, leveraged the film Stalag 17. Mm-hmm which I have to mention because I'm going to talk about Christmas and war and television series like MASH. Mm -hmm. And so we were all too familiar with war, and it was a time when it was just normal that there were substantial wars going on that involved the United States that included soldiers who were drafted, who were in the the army and the Navy through conscription. Yeah. And they're like, you get a ration of a of a pack of cigarette oh, cigarettes a week and <laughs> things. <Yeah. laughs> Just, if, if you live, if you live, <laughs> if you live long enough, and uh, but what's yeah. a, what's amazing is how normal that was. Mm-hmm. It was just normal, mm-hmm. and we don't realize how unusual war is now because there's always something going on. Yeah. We've got Russia and Ukraine. We've got Israel and Hamas. We've got things going on. Yeah, well, wars are sort of more like um, charity missions nowadays. Or it unfortunately. has been. Unfortunately. Um, unfortunately. Because you, you shouldn't be dying for charity yeah, wars. Yeah, we have no reason to be missions. in Iraq, no reason to be in Afghanistan, no, no reason to be in Korea, no reason to be... In, wars that we should not be involved in include any war that we don't intend to win. Right. So, The attitude about war right now is totally different, too, because we don't have a conscripted army. We don't have the draft. I know Selective Service is still out there. They still make you guys sign up at age 18, which is a travesty, but nobody's getting drafted. Nobody's being told you have to go out and fight and maybe die for this war, which maybe you believe in and maybe you don't. It's irrelevant. 
But when I was young, it was not that unusual. Mm -hmm. And that, with Christmas coming up, is something I'm grateful for. Yes. And and then you're not grateful to any particular individual other than the better of the thinkers, the intellectuals, the politicians, the cultural makers. But just my appreciation for what modern life is like in 2023. And I say this because, well, I'll get to that. But I do want to go back to World War II and the Korean War because there are so many movies even the Vietnam War, and I think, you know, John Lennon, give peace a chance, and happy Christmas, war is over, if you want it. I know, very hippy-dippy, very silly. My favorite band, Yes, has a song called Yours is No Disgrace, inspired by the Vietnam War that was going on at the time. Oh, I did know that, actually, that it was inspired by that. Yeah, well, John Anderson's lyrics are always very loose. You can interpret <laughs> yeah. them in many ways. But the main point that he was making dun, was dun, 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 these, dun, these dun, British dun, dun, soldiers, dun. he's a British singer, uh, but oh, American soldiers, yeah, yeah. too, who were being conscripted, who were being forced to go out and fight. You know, it's funny. He was telling them it wasn't their fault. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's it's a great song, and I just I just made the connection with the war. It's got a beat to it. It's almost kind of like a military beat and a, um, a guitar riff that goes with it um, that sounds kind of um, military-like. Yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah, they stole it from Bonanza, but those, oh. old, those old westerns had that kind of uh, kind of glory in the music. <laughs> There's no galloping sounds in it, though. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you're talking about uh, you know how how did people keep their spirits up in times of war? Exactly, real real war. They had it like, so much. Worse in that regard. Yeah, I know we're, that's minimizing anything that's going on today. You know, the kind of war that you think, gosh, you know, will the Germans take over the United States of America? No, not if we, you know, use our war rations properly and right. make enough sacrifices. And if we sell enough bonds and um, yes. and, and we don't use so much, you know, we recycle all of our tin. <laughs> You know, just yeah, and um, and and send the USO entertainers, send Bob Hope and the girls, the Andrews sisters, over to entertain the troops at Christmas time and throughout yes. the, the year, but especially at Christmas time. Yeah, and and you know the USO, um, which stands for United Service Organizations, um, is still around, and uh, we found out a little bit. It's actually a nonprofit charitable organization. It was chartered by Congress, but it relies on donations from individuals, corporations. Um, and organizations to support its programs. Um, and th yeah, they're still around doing things. Um, you know, they they uh, you know they do things for deployed service members, for military families, transitioning troops, families of the fallen and wounded, ill and injured uh, service members. Um, so that's really important. Uh, I think i'm I'm just really happy that they're still around. I didn't realize this. the USO. Yes. Mm-hmm. With the Andrew sisters. <laughs> yeah, did, didn't we say the president is the honorary? Yes. So since 1941, the, every president of the United States has been the honorary chairman of the USO. Um, yeah. Probably one of the few thing, decent things some of our presidents have done. Yes. I'm, I'm loving the chat here. On the Facebook side, Petya, who is Bulgarian, says, I reflect many times on the ability of my parents to create a normal, mm -hmm. happy family environment living in socialist communist bulgaria mm. traditions and daily rituals help yeah, yes i can yes. totally see that that's amazing it's absolutely amazing but yeah the thing and and again i always go back to to film and television the, in fact here's here's my asking you for some input here share with me if you have any at all your favorite war slash christmas movies mm. So, for example, Stalag 17. Yeah. A significant sequence in the film takes place Christmas time. Um, Christmas in Connecticut. Uh, I don't think we've watched that one together, but... Yeah, I don't know. Jim Ashley, I'm going to guess, is going to recommend that because Sydney, Sydney Greenstreet is in it. And Sydney Greenstreet is Jim's favorite actor. Yeah. I don't know. I think he's being a little cheeky when he says that, but maybe not. And Barbara Stanwyck is the star, so we mm, should definitely mm. see that. Oh, yeah, together. we need to do that. You know, it reminds me of, uh, it's sort of, it's kind of wartime-ish, but there's a celebratory atmosphere of it. Really, in a, and in, in it's actually expressed in such a profound way in Only Angels Have Wings. Oh, um, yeah. Where they're basically delivering the mail. It's a 
dangerous business. But uh, no matter what happens, um, people will keep cheering themselves up. I don't yeah, want to give away any not more. Not a war movie at all, but def always worth recommending. It, if you it, haven't seen Only Angels Have Wings, you, it should, has the you should watch that. It has an atmosphere of a war movie, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's full of pilots. Yeah. It's, Which um, makes me think of the uh, war song. I was talking about war songs. Uh, Sky Pilot mm. by War. By the band War. Oh. Uh, no, that wasn't War. That was uh, Eric Burden and the Animals. Oh. That's right. Sky Pilot. I don't know if I've heard this yeah. song before. Sky Pilot. <laughs> yeah. It's... Uh, I don't know. Sounds, yeah. sounds yeah. groovy. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yes. Share with us your favorite Christmas War movies, if you've got any. Anything that comes to mind. You know, even White Christmas, which yeah. you know, is taking place in the 1950s, but there's a call back to World War II. Yes. Because the, the three main characters were soldiers. Yeah, I guess Patia says, I like Operation Home. I, I, don't, know, I don't know if that's we'll a that movie up. or if Operation that's... Operation H-O-M-E. Yeah, let me look this up. Hmm. I don't know if that's an organization or a movie. Good, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be scouring the... Oh, uh, no, no, it's an organization. So, yeah. yeah. And, it, of course, Die Hard had to come up in the cool. chat. Thank you, Christopher, for that. Uh, Die Hard definitely is a Christmas movie. You can't watch the final sequence in there. No. When the, the snow is falling down at the end, it, except it's not snow. They're actually uh, bearer bonds. But still, you've got the Christmas music playing and uh, definitely a Christmas film. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, somebody. we got Jason saying 8-Bit um, Christmas was kind of fun. Okay. Um, I don't know what that uh, 8-bit Christmas We will look that up. We're looking, at, we're looking it up. And it's got to be something recent because the expression 8-bit. Oh, I guess it's uh, it's a quest to get the the Christmas gift of his generation, the latest and greatest video game system. I, I don't know. Is that a war? Oh, yeah. I heard of that when it came out a couple of years ago, but I have not seen it. Okay. Have to take a look. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Unsigned 32-bit individualist is in the chat, uh, I see. So there's there's four times as many bits right there. Ah, yes. Ooh, Petia says she recommends The Irony of Fate. It's a Russian Christmas movie in two parts. Ooh. Uh, you will find lots of philosophy and love and humor and communist reality. Yikes. Oof. Oof. But, Sounds uh, hardcore. We'll look it up. We'll look Let's it up. take a look. Ah, yes. So, I am filled with not just gratitude... But actual optimism, and this is the point that I want to make. Maybe I can make it quick and we can actually wrap up early, which we always say we're going to do and never actually do. The fact that we face so little war these days, and I don't mean to trivialize it. There is war. Uh, there's a lot to be angry about. There's a lot to fight. Uh, there's a reason why. I still participate in these ARC UK conversations. This is important. And what's going on in Eastern Europe is important. And the concerns about what's happening in China and the possibilities for Taiwan, it's all important. My point is, is not that things aren't bad. It's that they've always been bad in these ways. They're, war, war is a constant throughout history. But we are living in the best times in that regard. And it's the same with our general level of prosperity. And I mention that because inflation is out of control in the United States and we're all going to be with those homeless people soon. Except we're not. It's bad. I'm not saying it's not bad. But compare it to Argentina. Look at their inflation. Mm. Oh, wait, in Argentina, they just elected President Malay. They just elected an avowed capitalist. Now, he calls himself an anarcho-capitalist, but every policy he's putting forth tells me he doesn't really take the anarcho part too much to heart. For example, he doesn't want to end welfare right away. He wants to phase it out. Well, that's, I don't know. That's, that sounds awfully... Uh, reality-based, even if I don't agree with them on the policy. These are not the words of a hardcore anarcho-capitalist. We have reason to be grateful for the Argentine experiment. Now, if it goes really badly, maybe it'll give capitalism a bad name. But think about this. The kind of people you run into who are anti-capitalist, 
Mm-hmm. If President Millet does it badly, do you really think it's going to make them think any worse of it? No, I think only good things are going to come out of this. Mm-hmm. It, it's such a yeah. good thing. It's a reason to be not just optimistic, but cheerful, to be having a good time. We should be enjoying this. It's funny, uh, Harry Binswanger, doctor, Professor Harry Binswanger, was on, uh, now some of you wouldn't have heard this because this was the private meeting of the minds, invitation only, but having a conversation earlier today, and he mentioned when Donald Trump first came on the scene, and, and I think you all know Harry Binswanger is no fan of Donald Trump, but he said when Donald Trump was first on the scene and the way that Donald Trump would talk back to the media and cut through all the lies and tell them, no, you're lying right now, he actually found that refreshing, and I totally get it, too. Yeah. So, you know, Stephen's going to talk in the chat about mixed cases. you got to know what you love about somebody and what you hate about them. And you've got to know them both and then decide what's rational to do. And Millet is like that. I, I'm going to love this. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to have a good time with this. I think Argentina will do well, or at least better than they've been doing for a long time because of it. I do hope. I think it's a reason to be cheerful. I think it's a reason to be optimistic. And those stories you can find all over the place if you're looking for them. I hope you all uh, signed up for the doom-busting newsletter um, that uh, the folks at Human Action, the folks at Cato put out. It's, It's so good to read all of the good news going on, especially because, unfortunately, for better or for worse, we're not always sharing that stuff. And there is so much of it going on. And it's December. It's December 3rd. If you are an introvert, if you're a bit of a home buddy, get out. Go to the malls. Go to the museums. Go to any place that's advertised as a place Santa will be. (laughs) I still need to post the photographs, but yesterday morning we went to the gym. Uh, Amy and I are members of Planet Fitness. But we didn't go to our usual location yesterday. Yes, we went to a place... um that had uh, a couple of local um, uh, radio stations give, doing giveaways every 10 minutes. And they you would put your name in a drawing, and every 10 minutes they would... Unfortunately, we didn't win anything, but... I did. Oh, yeah, well, that's right. I wanted to spin well, the wheel thing. You had, there was a little spin the wheel that said, you know, I didn't actually you're not want a winner. Any, I, didn't, <laughs> but, I didn't actually want any of their swag, so I took a pen. Yes, yeah, so you got a pen, that and that's like a good pretty pen. cool. Um, and uh, everybody was super cheerful... Everybody was upbeat, and my gosh, the staff at Planet Fitness there, um, this was in a town called Oak Park, which is uh, kind of just outside of Detroit and Southfield. As a matter of fact, it's an area of, um, of ours. You know, we, <laughs> we talk about how many Muslims there are in Metro Detroit, um, but there are tons of Jewish people in Metro Detroit, and that's, that's where a lot of the uh, Jewish people are in Oak Park. Um, so we went there and it was just such a, the staff was dressed up to the nines in, in holiday gear and all of this. And everybody was super happy. And there was a real Santa Claus. He even had a Mrs. Claus with him. Yeah. You got Santa Claus, you got Mrs. Claus. That was all the reason we needed. Put on our gym clothes and drive out to <laughs> was great. Oak Park, Michigan <laughs> instead of our usual gym. It was so much fun. It was super so cool. Much fun. And I'm telling you all, get out there. Find Santa, because he is out there. Yes, everywhere. And, He's and everywhere. A good Santa. a good Santa will be Santa. You don't want a Santa who will, I'll use the expression, break character. You don't want that. No, you don't want to. No, a, you need real Santa. You don't want a Homer. You deserve Homer, to find uh, that. You should find that. You don't want a cynical, Absolutely. cynical Homer Simpson Santa. No, no, no. That's S- not the real one. Sam, no, the real uh, Santa Claus brought President Malay to Argentina. Yes. Uh, Akira in the chat is saying, the great thing about Malay is that the youth overwhelmingly supported. The youth supported a capitalist. How can that happen? And then Akira Felix goes on to say, I'm still not totally sold on Malay, but whatever they were doing was probably worse than what he's doing right now. I want to make this point just real quick. Take me 20 seconds. Malay is Argentina's Ronald Reagan. Malay is Argentina's Margaret Thatcher. Now, everything might go badly, but are we glad that there was at least 
A period of Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister of the UK? Oh, hell yes! And I think most of us are glad that whatever our criticisms of Ronald Reagan, are we glad that we had eight years of Ronald Reagan? Oh, hell yes. So I get it. I get the concerns. I told, And as I was saying in regard to uh, Stephen's love life, you do need to know what is the good, what is the bad. Don't ever lose sight of it. But don't let that squelch your enthusiasm. Right. You don't want to be a blind, yay, cheerleader. But you also don't want to be a Debbie Downer. Because neither one of those are reality-based. You want to be a rational cheerleader. Right. And, and, and when I say that, you know, it, it, there's the whole issue of virtue mining in another person, like Robert described it aptly. I love that. Virtue um, mining. Amy, virtue you're mining. the best. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, you know, you've got that. Don't do it to the point where you're sacrificing and you're, you're trying to dig so deep that you're not finding anything. Um, yeah. Well, so, it, yeah, if, if there is no value for you in being around the person, say the person is like a Debbie Downer, always coming up with the, uh, oh, gosh, that looks terrible over there, and just constantly complaining about things, you know, no, that's not somebody you want to be around. But no, if you if you do find somebody who is enthusiastic about life, um, it's important to give them a chance, give yourself a chance to be around them. Try well, to bring out the best I'm, in yourself. I'm, I was making them. a different point than that. Oh, okay. I'm not Sorry. talking about judging people as Debbie Downers. Oh, okay. I'm talking about you don't want to be that. Oh, sure. Yes. You don't want to be somebody who who finds the what's the uh, metaphor that I'm looking for? There's some people who find the the silver lining in every cloud, and there are some people who find the cloud in every sky. Yeah. You want to be the former, and you don't want to say there aren't such a thing as clouds because I can see the sun. No, you've got to see the whole picture. But you've also got to know what matters. Right. You know, it goes back to, um, that point goes back to uh, the wonderful Jean Maroney talk that we had on, on ARC UK. Um, when I asked her some question or whatever, but uh, she gave me this answer. It was really, really like kind of mind blowing for me. Um, when I was asking her about, you know, negative things in your life. And kind of dwelling them and churning on them, you know, catastrophizing, you know, like a lot of people do with regard to um, climate change and such. Um, but like I, I had a particular question and everything and she asked me, is that a threat? Is that really a threat? Is it really a threat to you? Or is it just something that is, um, you know, disappointing or yeah, that annoying? Was, that was brilliant. Because, is it really a threat? Yeah. You know, being kind of philosophical, it's all too easy to see something bad in the culture and say, that is threatening me personally. Mm -hmm. Or that is making the world a, pl a worse place in a big substantial way, even though there are 100,000 other things going on that are just as important or just as unimportant. So, yeah, it's a great question to ask. <laughs> but what really matters... Yeah. And what ties all of this together, the reason why, for example, I still recommend the film It's a Wonderful Life, as long as you don't take it as a uh, call for self-sacrifice, for altruism. And I get why some people hate that movie. And it's not my favorite movie either. But when people tell me they love that movie, and then they tell me why they love it, there are good reasons why that is some folks' favorite movie. There are also bad reasons. Uh, some people will tell you, oh, I like it because he's willing to sacrifice for his family and his town. Yeah, that's a bad reason. It's not the whole movie. It's not the whole thing. you got to know what you love. you got to know why you love it. But the first and foremost thing, and you know, maybe this will help Akira Felix. Maybe this will help Stephen. Maybe this will help me and all of you. The first and foremost thing is... Values, now, I don't mean your abstract values in your head. I mean the real stuff out in the world that, that has value to you. Values are primary. You are here to live a life and not just to not die. Contrary to what Jordan Peterson says, you're here to enjoy yourself and not just avoid pain. You are here to live a life, a rich life. And by rich, what does that mean? Oh, I found the philosophical meaning behind the thing that I like. 
No. I mean, you should find the philosophical meaning behind the things that you like. But you should have the things you like. You should be living as if you are surrounded by miracles. Yes. Because the reality is, you are. Right now, 2023, here, life on earth. The reason why people during wartime could still find values is because they were surrounded by them, including each other and their families and their homes and, and the friends that they cared about, the things that they were willing to fight for. We have all that and more now. Some new disvalues, mm -hmm. but also a lot fewer of the big disvalues, the real threats to our lives. Yes. Christmas is coming, and it is coming for you. Ah. <laughs> and me. Santa's coming to give Santa's you your, on his way. your just desserts. Everything that you deserve. <laughs> you know, I want you to think about that. If they're really, because you know, we have folks saying, if you tell your kid Santa's real for a while, let him live with that magic. Imagine if Santa was real. He, or for you religious people, imagine if... There really is God or Jesus, or I think they're supposed to be the same person. He's three, three, three gods in one. But whatever it is, we'll go with Santa. Imagine that Santa really sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. I want you to be able to look in the mirror and say, God, I wish that was true. I hope Santa can see me because I am good. And you are good, too. Well, I hope that you have the vocabulary in yourself to describe what you're proud of about yourself, your actions, your achievements, your accomplishments, your mental processes, your epistemology, going all the way down there to the fact that you are a rational person and you make good, good life-affirming, life-enhancing, joyful choices for yourself in your life. Something to be proud of. Um, you know... Uh, I want to go back real quick. I know we're going to probably go a little long tonight, but, um, you know, a lot of people are a little bit, oh, you know, Amy and Robert, don't, uh, don't say that you're pro-Israel and all this stuff. And, you know, I've, I've been wearing my, not tonight, but I've, I have been wearing my Star of David earrings to work and outside to the gym, to wherever we're going, to yesterday. We went to, to some places. I don't get any flack from anybody <laughs> no. and we live right and, across the border from dearborn heights which is the west side of dearborn michigan and amy works in dearborn michigan yes <laughs> and uh and well and this is my approach here um because i think somebody in the chat here said that somebody that they, that they knew had the israeli flag up on instagram and people and, and that person was getting um some heat for it or whatever some foolishness and shenanigans for it. And so they took it down. Um, well, the one thing I want to consider, and this is something that I had to kind of go through in my own mind, in my own understanding and put words to it, is that when I, you know, when I say I am pro-Israel, what you can say is you, you, can, you can say to yourself, you know what, my approach should be values are primary here so when i do talk to somebody about it i haven't yet i haven't had that opportunity but at some point i might be able to i can say i support israel um because uh and and then you give your reasons you know you can say i support jewish people in israel because they focus on living life on earth and they have such perseverance uh, with, you know, in, in, in the face of adversity and they keep bouncing back and they keep wanting to make their, their country the best country that they, that they understand that it can be, that they provide freedom for Arabs and Muslims within Israel. You know, there's 24 synagogues in Israel itself. Um, that there's a freedom of religion, that they respect each other's individual rights and their property rights, and they encourage people to live life in a, in a happy and joyful and large way. Um, and they want everybody around them to be prosperous, no matter what their background is. And I really love that about Israel and Israelis and Jewish people. I love that about them. And then if somebody says, 
mm, free Palestine or whatever, you can say, well, what do you love about Palestinians? What What's your favorite part or what's your favorite character trait that Hamas projects that you most admire? <laughs> I'm sure you're going to get a really dumb look on their face. <laughs> Because when you approach it in terms of values, no one can say anything because um, no one's really thought about it. It's a funny thing with this, this whole Hamas-Israel war going on because so many people have dehumanized Jewish people as they're too rich. You know what? They're too prosperous. They're too happy. They shouldn't be like that. They should sacrifice for their the people around them, and, and you know, and they should leave that country and give it back to the Palestinians and all this other stuff. You know, whatever. Um, and there's a lot of anti-capitalist, anti-Semitism going on right now. Um, and uh, <laughs> oh, where was I going with this? It, it's just you, you've got to. Oh yeah the dehumanization of Jewish people, but there's also conversely, strangely enough, a strange dehumanization of Muslims and Palestinians and even Hamas. People don't think of them as human. They think of them as victims, as pets, as animals, as some charity case. They don't think them think of them as actual human beings that, that have moral agency. They think of them as they're powerless. They are downtrodden and all of this other stuff. They dehumanize them that way. And uh, it's an interesting thing because when you get back to values and you have those words for describing virtues and admirable human character traits, all this, all this goes away. All of the nonsense and shenanigans go away. All the hatred goes away. All the violence go away. Um... Anyway, that's what I've been finding, and I, I hope that that can inspire some people to take a look at this a little bit differently. Um, and, and I've been trying to untangle this whole thing myself, and I've come to the conclusion that, you know, you can say, you know what, if, if, if you truly care about Palestinians and Muslims, <laughs> you need to, then you need to intervene because they're self-destructing. They're self-destructing. They are basing their actions on the afterlife. They feel that they that they are backed into a corner and the only thing that they have left in life is to kill, kill other people so that they can have an experience of heaven after they're dead. You know, that is not the way to live. Absolutely not the way to live. You need to they need to intervene. They need, just as if you have a drug addict, you have a heroin addict, and the family holds an intervention. Muslims need to hold interventions for themselves and ask themselves if they want to actually live on earth or if they just want some other person to die so that they can have an afterlife that's pleasant. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, I know, but... That's, that's what we're dealing with. Those are the values or the anti-values that we're dealing with here. So yes, if you love your Muslim neighbors, let them know that it's okay to live on earth and they don't need to justify them, themselves by their hatred or their bloodlust for other people. Live here on earth with, with us and actually be happy, be prosperous, be virtuous. So there's my Christmas message. <laughs> I have more because uh, I would like to share um, my ornaments. What do you have to say, Robert? Oh, I was done. I have some things to share. I know we're a little over time. Is it okay, Robert, or yeah. no? Yeah. Go right ahead. So these are some ornaments that I created long, long, long time ago. And, you know, if you go to one of those things remembered gift shops, you know, in the mall, um, you can find these things where you can uh, engrave the ornaments yourself or have them engrave it for you. So I actually created ornaments based on Ayn Rand's Seven Virtues. So 
I'm just going to show this off. This is uh, this is for productiveness. So we've got the uh, abundant uh, sleigh here in a little slow, a snow globe kind of thing. Well, there are no Christmas presents without productivity. That is correct. We have um, this one here is called Pride. Um, this is representing pride. So you've got a little kitty cat kind of <clears throat> playing with a bell on a wreath here. It's just sort of like, you know... Well, he's reaching up. He's reaching Pride up. Pride is reaching for the best. Yes, That's, exactly. Uh, Ayn Rand referred to uh, Aristotle's definition the, of moral ambition. Yes, or the crown of the virtues. The ambitious. <laughs> yes. We have Santa here, and guess what he represents? Justice. That's right. <laughs> That's right, because bad kids get a lump of coal. A reminder that next year you should try harder. <laughs> yes. It's very rare that Santa would do that. <laughs> You'd have to be pretty bad. Yes, to yes. To get a lump of coal and not at least yes. some charming item in your stocking. And uh, we have this one here. It's a partridge in a pear tree. And so it's a tree kind of gives you a little bit of a clue as to what the virtue represents, which is integrity. So, you know. In what way would the tree represent integrity? Well, you have um, you have your fundamental ideas here, your fundamental philosophy of of uh, reason and reality. Oh, and all the branches and are all integrated. All the branches are integrated. You have integrity. Very good. Yes. So it's all one integrated. Uh, it's like a good epistemology kind of thing. <laughs> and then we've got this one here, which is a just a lovely little um, ornament kind of thing. And that represents, what are we left with here? This is honesty. Honesty. A, 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 like, like the kind of like the crown jewels of virtues here. You've got honesty, which is something everybody needs. They need to be in touch with what is real and what is true and good about themselves. And uh, I think that's it. Oh, wait a minute. We got one more. And we have here, we've got a reindeer. And uh, who looks a little bit like Rudolph. <laughs> and Rudolph represents the virtue of independence. That's right. That's right. Yes. Let, let's be independent together. Right. <laughs> and lastly, I just want to say um, this, is a, this is something from 1998, 1998. Way back when. Oh, look how shiny and lovely it is still. It it's, better than the others. Yeah, it's like a little wreath with a dollar sign here. And where did that one come from? It says at the bottom here, it says, Ayn Rand Institute, ah. <laughs> 1998. Oh, so yeah. They haven't very, sent very us any cool. Christmas ornaments in a no, while. They, they don't really do this. I think this. we probably paid for that. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a, it was a donation. It was a gift to donors at the hmm. time. Um, yeah, we'll have yes. to get them to get on oh, that. Oh, and one more, of course. This is the uh, what's, what all the other virtues stem from. Can you guess? <laughs> We've got a, a nice wreath here. And we've got five little bells on the wreath. So this represents rationality, which is the um, the high. Th this is basically the mo most fundamental virtue because it represents the faculty of reason. And I think of the little five bells as the five senses. Isn't it nice? The senses are valid. Very nice. With rationality. So yay! Merry rational Christmas. <laughs> now, you good people, uh, I know you're thinking, well, they sure went long and they said it might be a short show because they had something else to do. Mm -hmm. It turns out the something else to do is actually next Sunday, not this Sunday. So we get a big, long, juicy, meaty, beady, big and bouncy show today. Next Sunday could be the one where we either have to reschedule or make it short or do something else really creative, undoubtedly interesting, exciting, and perhaps perplexing, but we will see what happens. I want to wrap you up with my post-it note for the day, which says, keep Scrooge throughout the year. <laughs> you know, every year we talk about the, the Charles Dickens story, A Christmas Carol. And even better than the story, the many, the many adaptations that have been made of it, different movies. Y'all have suggested to us some of your favorite versions of A Christmas Carol. And one of Scrooge's lessons is he learns to keep Christmas past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And most of us interpret that as keep the spirit of Christmas throughout the year. But I'm realizing I want to keep Scrooge throughout the year. And the reason is the story of Scrooge 
is not of a bad man learning to become good. And it's not a story about man learning altruism. It's not even a story of a man learning kindness. Because if, if you pay attention to the backstory of Scrooge, no, this is a story of a man rediscovering his values, his passion. Yes. It's a beautiful story in that regard. And I don't ever want to lose that. Occasionally right. things will happen. I'll hear a piece of music. I'll see a performance. I'll see something happen that that kind of makes me well up. You know, that... that that almost crying feeling of something really important going on there. And I realized that I need more of that. I need to be more in touch with that. I don't want to be like Scrooge at the beginning of the movie, where I've learned to tamp down on my passions in order to manage my many disappointments over the years or or all of the things that have happened to me or all the reasons why so many of us uh, quote-unquote put away childish things or adult things you know, Francisco d'Anconia, Ayn Rand of all people, said, the only man never to be reclaimed is the man without passion. So I'm going to work very hard to keep Scrooge in my in my soul throughout Scrooge the year. Scrooge is the best. He is a wonderful redemption story. I will bring him up again, which yes. is why I bring him up tonight. So, folks, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your comments in the chat. Amy, thank you for your Christmas message, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is getting kudos in the chat here, I see. And we'll do this again. We will be back. I don't know if we're going to do an interview this week. We may do another midweek interview. Who knows? But if we don't, we will see you next weekend, whether it's Sunday at 6 o'clock, some other time. we got a lot more to say before December 25th. Hmm. In the meantime, join us on the socials, facebook.com slash Robert Nacer, facebook.com slash Amy Nacer. Talk back. There is a 5 Minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer Facebook group where you can also tell us your ideas of what we've been doing and what you think we should be doing. Any ideas you have for future shows, whatever would be good for you to hear from us or for you to say back to us in the chat. Oh, and we, we'd like for you to be our Santa um, and bring us uh, our just desserts and what we deserve this year. So if you are... Uh, inclined to do so, please become a patron. Oh, our patrons. Thank you to our patrons. Thank yeah. you to those of you who, who support what we do. Thank you to our Santas. <laughs> you can find the links to Patreon and also PayPal for one-time contributions at robertnacer.com. And yes, a big hearty thank you and Merry Christmas to all of you who do support what we do here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or whenever that is, wherever in the world you are. And with that said... I would give you Christmas greetings, but we got a whole bunch of that coming up. I'm not going to say Merry Christmas. Yeah, I am. Of course I am. Merry <laughs> Christmas to you. And also, we wish you... It's funny. I asked on Facebook, what do you wish for Christmas? And everybody jumped on, wish, wish. Objectivists don't use that word. It's a dirty word. What's wrong with you? You should be condemned. Somebody call ARI and throw these guys out. Okay, they didn't say that, but no. it might just as well have been that. Oh, I don't think in terms of wishes... Well, your answer told me that made that a lot. I'm not going to criticize. No, I totally no. get it. We are not whim worshippers here, but I do wish you a Merry Christmas. And we wish you every success that you so richly deserve. I think you've earned more than you even realize. But I wouldn't want that to stop you from being even more ambitious. And so we wish you all the happiness all of the flourishing that comes with the exercise of your virtues and the attainment of your values. And that is why, as always, and maybe even in a bigger way than usual, because it is December 3rd, the month of Christmas, we wish you love. Mm -hmm.